10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Esteemed delegates, welcome to Diplomacy Camp, the 31st annual BYU Model United Nations Conference. My name is Anna Breiner, and I am the Secretary General and Director of the Human Rights Council One. On behalf of our 42 person staff at BYU, we are so excited to have you join us for our first ever all digital diplomacy experience. We know some of you have done this before in a different form, and some of you have ne never done this before, but either way, we hope you'll have a great experience today. As is tradition at BYU, we're going to start this event with a prayer by Liam Dalton, who is directing the UNHCR committee and is the director general. We will then hear a welcome from, prof from Professor Valerie Hudson of the Bush School of Government and Public Policy at Texas A&M. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity that we have to be gathered together virtually. We are so grateful for this chance that we have to have a mock session and also have this opportunity to meet incredible people and to hear from wonderful speakers and the experiences that they've had. Father, we are so excited for the chance that we have to learn more in this session and also to come closer together. Uh, at this time, Father, we ask a special blessing upon those who are suffering with the pandemic, as well as those who are suffering all across the world from various, um, various incidences and, and various problems that they're currently facing in their country or internationally. Please protect them, um, help them feel of thy love, and please, Father, help us to know how we can better serve the world and better serve each other. And this we pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, amen. I'm delighted to address you today. I understand that you are here for diplomacy camp, and I understand that there are um, many of you who are from around the world in addition to the United States, so welcome. I'm also excited that you are interested in diplomacy. This is a proud time in the international system. We have uh, new and rising powers. We have uh, alliances that are not what they once were. It's a time of great change. Uh, we have new technologies, uh, technologies that will give governments more control than they perhaps ever have had uh, before. And so at this critical time period, to know that there are young people like yourselves that are interested in gaining skills in diplomacy and perhaps pursuing a career in diplomacy is, is heartening to say the least. Why is diplomacy so important? Well, I myself am not a diplomat, but I uh, work in push school at government and public service at Texas a University. And so on our faculty, we have a number of distinguished uh, former diplomats. Uh, and I can tell you, that I have watched them carefully and have discovered that the skills that they have acquired through their long careers as diplomats have made a positive difference in this world. One of the hardest things to do is to get someone to agree with you when they don't agree. And it takes a lot of self-discipline.
So, for example, um, one of the major thrusts of my research has been to demonstrate in rigorously empirical fashion how what's going on with women in a country actually has very heavy impacts on a wide variety of dimensions of national security. Uh, so uh, not simply uh, conflict and terrorism, but also the type of governance, the quality of governance, health indicators, wealth indicators, and even environmental preservation. Uh, demography uh, is in some senses uh, shaping our new um, international system, and demography rests in the very first place on the character of relations between men and women in a society. Uh, so I hope that uh, the kinds of things that uh, I'm researching and that others are researching will help you. Uh, are you at uh, peace negotiations where there's no women represented? If so, then please understand that that peace will not be durable because studies have shown that peace agreements where women were part of the negotiations last 30% longer than those that do not. Um, we can also see how women are at the front line of care in pandemics. Uh, care for children, the elderly, and the ill is often a gendered task in most societies. Most of the frontline workers, nurses, uh, aides, will be female. So paying attention to female voices, female perspectives, and female concerns are going to be key in any response to a pandemic. So in other words, I hope that you as a, uh, a budding diplomat will uh, pay attention to the types of research that uh, scholars do. If you are interested in further information about the situation of women worldwide, let me suggest to you an awesome and free online database. Uh, and that database is one that I helped create. It's called the Woman Stats Database, womanstats.org. And you will find there almost 300,000 pieces of information about all sorts of phenomena related to women in um, 176 countries, all those countries with at least 200,000 population in the world. Well, I'll leave you now, and I hope that you will have a fantastic time uh, here at Diplomacy Camp. And who knows, perhaps one day I will see you at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M. Thank you. Excuse me, can you hear me? Well, welcome. Thanks to Professor Valerie Hudson for that welcome. Uh, we welcome all of you as well on behalf of Brigham Young University and the Kennedy Center for International Studies. This is our first diplomacy camp ever. It's a, a very surreal experience, but we're grateful that you have made the effort to prepare to join us. For those of you, as Secretary General Briner mentioned, uh, have, have done this before, and this is not your first experience. Uh, but for those who are brand new, and this is your first time learning about diplomacy and international affairs, this is the right place as well. We're looking forward on behalf of our staff to getting to know you, to helping you, and to helping you learn and have a good experience today. It's my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Ambassador Deborah K. Jones. Ambassador Jones retired from the U.S. Department of State in 2016 with the rank of career minister following a distinguished 34 year career, including as US ambassador to Libya and US ambassador to Kuwait, as well as serving as principal officer in Istanbul, Turkey. Along the way, as you would imagine, she had many different posts around the world, serving in Argentina, Iraq, Syria, Ethiopia, the UAE and Tunisia. 
Ambassador Jones received a Bachelor of Science in History, magna cum laude from Brigham Young University, where she also did graduate studies in the humanities and taught at BYU's Study Abroad Madrid program. She has a master's degree in national security strategy from the National War College of National Defense University. There are many other things we could tell about Ambassador Jones. I will encourage you to go on the kennedy.byu.edu website, Bridges Magazine, where you can read a full interview with Ambassador Jones that was just recently published. It's my great pleasure on behalf of Diplomacy Camp to welcome our first keynote speaker, Ambassador Deborah K. Jones. Thank you very much and uh, welcome and good morning to all of you future diplomats out there. I also want to thank uh, Valerie for that wonderful introduction. She actually kind of covered everything that I might want to say, but um, of course she's an academic, I'm a practitioner, so it will be fun to talk to all of you a little bit about uh, the actual practice of diplomacy and what that means. First of all, I want to say that all of you are going to be diplomats in one way or the other anyway, because the word diplo diplomat comes from the Greek word diplo and the same root as diploma, which you will receive. And a diploma is simply nothing more than a folded paper that's your accreditation that says you've learned something, you have the authority to speak on something. And in the case of a diplomat, it simply means that you are accredited by your government with full faith to go forward and represent the interests of your country uh, to another country. Now, of course, diplomacy has uh, earned a, a, a reputation, uh, good and bad. One of my favorite um, uh, sayings is that the art of the diplomat is to conceal all turbulence behind a smile. And we are very good at that. And I will try to get a little bit behind the smile today, although you'll see a lot of smiling and share with you some of the other side of that. Um, I think there are less flattering uh, descriptions. Mark Twain famously said once that a diploma, a, a diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the ride. Um, some have also said it's the art of, sell, of telling a woman happy birthday while forgetting her age very conveniently. But the point is that diplomacy is the art, in, in my opinion, is, uh, is the art of finding space for agreement within the same word. And in this re regard, I really liked what Valerie had to say about that, Professor Valerie, uh, uh, about Adam and Eve, because really it is based on getting people to agree in a world of competition for scarce resources that we will agree to a plan of action that, I, that benefits both of us if possible, or that aids us in um, winning the competition if possible, or uh, helps us to avoid at very best conflict, but if not, uh, will at least help us to lay the ground, words, ground rules for that conflict. And in this regard, and I love what she said about men and women and the role of women in the world, because the fact of the matter is since Adam and Eve, there has been competition over approaches and the resources and how to use them. And that has gone on and on and on and on, and it's not going to change. Modern diplomacy, of course, is based on the post-Westphalia structure of nation states, that the world is somehow organized in these very orderly nation states and that we are able to deal with the entire country as a whole based on whomever its leadership is. That world has changed dramatically uh, through technology and the flattening of technology, the flattening of information flows and the ultimate democratization of, of uh, that world. And let me back up a little bit though, because I think we all uh, think of the world in terms, I mean, if you look at our governance structures, uh, churches, buildings, and I mentioned some of this in my interview with, the Mag with Bridges Magazine, they are structures of hierarchies, that there is a head of the church, that there is a head of government, and that somehow we can manage all of our business by dealing with these heads. In fact, ambassadors, uh, and I'll get back to that a little bit later, our full title was Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary. It's quite a, an imposing title. It means that you are fully and wholly empowered to speak for your government on behalf of your government. And that is assuming that we were dealing in a world that really was only connecting at the tops, at the tip, that an ambassador took that accreditation and went to another government and was able to speak to the head and fiat looks, everything would be done at the uh, down 
descending down from that. We all know that that is no longer the case, if it ever was the case. We all know now that we have to recognize different factors in, in the world and how it functions and diplomacy and those interactions of, of global interaction and global commerce. The reality is that the world has always been global. That is, from the time of Marco Polo and anyone who has gone out to do commerce in another country, they have brought back business, they've brought back mores, they've bought, brought back food habits, they've brought back cultural changes um, that in this day and age, we don't even see anymore because we're like fish swimming in the water. We take it for granted that we live in a global world, that we are able to fly wherever we want to fly, where we're able to eat what we want to eat. We buy clothes made all over the world. We buy food things that are produced in Mexico or all over the world. And I'm going to tell you something that if you have ever bought, a, you know, if, if you're older, put a stamp on a ticket, you know, on a, on a letter that's mailed overseas or bought an airline ticket, flown to a foreign country, had a passport, of course, uh, bought clothing that's manufactured elsewhere, uh, uh, bought food that's grown elsewhere, any of these things, you have benefited from diplomacy, from the art of people at all levels of diplomacy going out and negotiating um, and brokering these deals between countries, this international order. Now, something else that was mentioned earlier, and I think is really important is because where we are right now, because the United States, we're in a moment of great um, transition, I would say, uh, where the United States, the approach to the world after World War II, of course, was to establish and extend this liberal world order that we would go out uh, to um, you know, ensure that everyone was playing by the same rules, essentially. And that was kind of fine for us because we were the predominant power and we could somehow in our minds reinforce the rules that benefited us and kind of ignore the rules that we didn't like so much. But, at, but overall, there was a sense that there was a, an expanding order after World War II that countries would abide by that. And the role of diploma, diplomats is certainly from all countries was basically to find ways to have their countries integrate into that order and play according to tariffs, uh, according to rules and regulations, according to security regulations. You know, we have, I mean, our FT, our in the United States, I know we have a lot of international students there, but you are probably more familiar with it than many Americans are. We have teams in other countries that make sure that airports are secure, uh, that people are abiding by trade rules, that we're checking on uh, the safety of, of products that are made overseas, etc. And so it is a very complicated web. And my point in, in telling you that is that uh, that that job of finding space for agreement in the same world word is more important than ever because again let me go back to it there's always going to be competition for scarce resources and space there is always going to be room for cooperation that you can find and there is always going to be uh, the potential for conflict um, so again competition cooperation conflict choices that countries have to make and have to make on the basis of, of value systems or what they believe is happening. Right now we're in a kind of a, uh, not unanticipated, it's kind of a global period of uh, nationalism, reassessing uh, disruption that is caused by uh, technology. And technology has always been a great disruptor. And I think, let me, if I could emphasize one thing to anyone wanting to go into diplomacy as a profession, it is history, history, history. You really need to take the time to read what has happened before so that you approach things now with a certain uh, sobriety and also a calm that assures you that this is not the first time that this has happened and that it is inevitable that this technology, which is immediate, which is the installation of a chip in a phone or uh, is going to disrupt politics and human interactions, which are by nature organic. I always tell people, I give a little quiz. I said, how, how long does it take for a child to gestate? Nine months, a baby. Um, uh, 100 years ago, how long did that take? Nine months. 1,000 years ago, how long did that take? Nine months. And every single little child has to be taught to be part of civil society. 
It has to be taught that there are certain things that are acceptable and unacceptable. We all learn that we need to stop at a stop sign. We all need to learn what we do at a four way stop, you know, and if people stop learning those things, um, we're going to have a world of chaos. And so it begins, really, it does begin in the home of civilizing uh, each little human being. And that is a difficult and long process. And then getting them to learn how to play well in the sandbox um, is very important as well. We always say that there are three rules. The rules of the sandbox apply in diplomacy, which is that I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Uh, you know, learning how to play telephone correctly to convey messages in a cue that are as accurate at the end as they are at the beginning. And at the end of the day, understanding the power relationships of who's bigger and who's stronger and figuring out a way that you're going to share that sandbox. But those things take time. Governance is always catching up with the disruptions of technology, whether it was the printing press that made more people literate, that made more people have access to information, that who then suddenly began to challenge their governments and their churches and everything else saying, well, wait a minute, uh, you, we've been taking for granted what you've told us about what this says and how it belongs. Now, they were seeing it for themselves. And now we have almost the extreme side of that where we have so much information flowing in and information that's not necessarily true and, and no kind of agreed uh, standard for what is truth or what is actually happening in the world. You know, for those of us, and I'm ancient, older even than Brother Leonard here, um, I, you know, we grew up listening to Walter Cronkite on the news. We grew up watching the same television series uh, growing up, Leave it to Beaver or you know, Lassie or whatever. We were all watching the same things on our screens every night. And, I'm, and, and that has an impact. We were also watching, believe it or not, uh, you know, propaganda in the form of cartoons. We were, I grew up during the Cold War and we watched uh, Rocky Bullwinkle and Boar and, and um, you know, Moose and Squirrel, whatever. And in fact, the bad guys in that were Boris Badenov and Natasha and American children were indoctrinated that Russians were bad guys and that you had to really watch out for anyone who had that accent. And, I, and, and later on when I was ambassador to Libya and my EU uh, counterpart was a Bulgarian. And I said, you know, Natalia, I, it's, it's really taking me turning my head around to realize that you're a colleague and you're a, 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 an ally in our process here and not an enemy because these, that's just the reality. So what technology has also done though, is flattened, you know, I know that a lot of aspiring diplomats we read, you know, we all read uh, the long letter from the, you know, the X letter from Moscow that, that established Cold War, as strategies for the United States. We all wanna be that person who writes that cable. Um, the reality is people don't have time to read long cables like that anymore. And a lot, many of them don't reach the top leadership. You still have to do a lot of writing in diplomacy, but in fact, a lot of it's pithier. It's more focused on different areas. As we heard earlier, you know, it's politics. It's not just politics, it's economics, it's demographics. It's, it's uh, technology advances, it's competition, it's pandemic help now, it's human rights, it's refugees, and things that proceed, you know, that, that become part of our policy that at one point were not. People forget that Jimmy Carter, for example, introduced the whole human rights agenda in American diplomacy and in our, in our national policy, foreign policy, and was highly criticized for that at the time, and even by Ronald Reagan, who, who followed him, but guess what? Ronald Reagan didn't change that policy. And that's another area that I want to instill in you is that where we're seeing some kinds of changes now that historically and traditionally in the United States, and I think in most other countries too, which are more tend to be somewhat more hierarchical, but our foreign policy has always been bipartisan. It's been made on the basis of shared national interests. Because let me get back to one singular point for especially for all of you who want to be diplomats, your central role is to protect your national interests overseas. It's not about being a goody two shoes or anything. It's about determining what is best for Americans, you know, as a country, for the safekeeping of the country, what's best for your own countries. 
And that, and people may have different approaches to that. And those are the policy approaches that we're struggling with now. What is, what is the different approach to what makes America safer or any other country, you know, for your own, uh, from whatever your perspective is for those of you who are listening here. And that is where the argumentation comes in that traditionally we have said, if the world looks more like us, it's a safer place for us. But what happens when the world doesn't choose to look more like us? And those are the real challenges of diplomacy too. What happens when the world feels that our trade is, that, tr that global uh, trade or global standards is not fair, it doesn't work for their societies? What happens when there's a cultural or religious um, imperative to change the way things work? And in the United States, I think we are learning uh, in with a lot of hard knocks and bruises, and that's what we've come to this discussion now and this, this kind of very active discussion within the United States about what is best for American interests. And you've seen that even in the reactions, different reactions to how we deal with the COVID, uh, with the pandemic that has come. So, and I will mention, you know, the US originally, we've all heard this, we had this notion that we were going to be free of foreign entanglements. You know, I think everyone's heard that kind of myth. That's not entirely true. We've always been a commercial nation and we've needed commercial engagement. But there were three things in our history that have really turned our foreign policy uh, and, and what the founding fathers had kind of thought we could manage with, have kind of twisted it a little, and each one of them involve attacks on the homeland, what we feel are attacks on the homeland. The first was, of course, the burning of the White House in 1812 during the, the war, that war. And that's following that, within several years, the U.S. had established the Monroe Doctrine, which was essentially to say, stay out of our hemisphere. Um, or we will push back on that, which led to other engagements. The second episode of that that really had a transformation in American policy was the attack on Pearl Harbor, which led us to go into the war, not against Japan, against uh, the Germans essentially first, because it was an ideological, suddenly we realized there was a totalitarian world out there that was going to have an impact on how we were able to do business and on how we were able to expand and go into the world and thrive. And the third one, of course, which is so odd to me to believe that this actually preceded um, some of your lifetimes, was the 9-11 uh, attacks in, the, in New York, which I would suggest have had a, not only did they, they lead us into the realm of preemptive war when we, attack, when we went to Iraq, which we've never done before, uh, but it also has uh, changed, I think, American views on, of feeling safe in the world or of welcoming the world because it was a huge betrayal of American hospitality and the openness. And those of us who've been around for decades um, know how, how uh, fundamentally that has changed the way we do business, the way we welcome people, the way we travel even within our own country and the way we were able to travel around the world. So these are all important things to remember. They make a, they make a difference as well. But the point I, I mostly wanna make is that there's still plenty of business for diplomacy at all levels. We still need to work together and it's exciting. It's great work. It is the best work in the world and it's satisfying work and it's hard work. And I wanna make just a small, um, comment about it, and I wish we could do a, a question and answer because I'm probably better at this than, than the rest of it. But you know, I want to remind people too, when I started diplomacy, there were not there were no emails when I came into the Foreign Service in 1982. Imagine that. Of course, imagine 1982. We did have cars, we had been to the moon, but we didn't have emails. We also had a very top secret secure system for secure conferencing that that, that was video conferencing between uh, branches of the U.S. government that we used. And now, of course, everyone can have, uh, you know, um, secure conferencing commercially. All these things have changed things. We thought the fax was a miracle that electrons could travel through space and land somewhere else. You know, I, all these things, I mean, there was no Twitter, there was none of this other very rapid fire uh, you know, information uh, sharing. And this is all, it all has been hugely disruptive. And it's also frankly made the role of an ambassador a very different role because those hierarchies again, do not exist in the same way. And so I, I do want to say to people, if you're coming into the, to diplomacy saying, I'm doing this because I want to be an ambassador, um, I'm gonna offer you a few First statistics and a couple of stories. I mean, frankly, that's like joining uh, Google because you want to become the CEO. 
um, in, you know, you really got to love the enterprise and the work and what it is you're doing. And that's what's going to sustain you through some pretty, uh, you know, difficult and, and prosaic work that you're going to have to do is so um, statistics, there are about 13,000 foreign service officers in the US government right now. There are openings coming all the time. But out of that, there are probably about um, total ambassadors. You know, we have political appointees in our business as well as career. So there are about a total of, I think, 114 um, career ambassadors, some of those who've been ambassadors twice. You know, so think about those statistics and what the odds are when you're coming in. Um, and, and look at that realistically. Most of them become ambassadors after a period of about, uh, most people enter the foreign service on average between 30 and 34 years of age. That's gone up, that age has gone up. Um, most of those ambassadors are named when they're in their 50s. The average time you're gonna spend in the foreign service is well over 25, 26, 27 years before you are named ambassador. So I just want you to put that into the, and, and remember, and I'm going to share with the BYU students another story. When I was a student at BYU a thousand years ago, but we did have the Big Mac still. And we would have, during conference time, we would have all a general conference for the ladies, for the women at BYU. And in this case, the wife of the prophet at the time was Spencer W. Kimball, much beloved. And his wife was also much beloved, Camilla, uh, Camilla Kimball who um, had been born also in, in Colonia Dublon, where my grandfather was born and, and the prophet was born, was, not, was born in Salt Lake, but actually grew up in Thatcher, Arizona, where my grandmother had grown up and they'd gone to the same academy. And someone asked uh, the prophet's wife, what is it like being married to a prophet? And she said, I didn't marry a prophet. I married a, a student, someone who was studying to be a school teacher. My point is in life, you know, life takes us in different directions. And the way you get there is to do your best and to do your best by learning the tools of the trade. And there's plenty of room in the foreign service. Again, let me just reiterate or in diplomacy for everything from, you know, textile negotiations to open skies agreements to um, uh, epidemic work, to work with refugees, to work with, um, you know, consular issues. But our number one, the core thing is, do you believe in the institution? Do you believe in the work? Do you love your country? And are you interested in advancing the interests of Americans or your own nationals in a way that we all benefit each other? And so I wish you well. I hope that that I'm sure there's a lot I'm leaving off, but I hope I leave you with the notion that it's good work. It's the best work in the world. It's about listening. It's not about salesmanship. There's a big difference. You know, you may love countries, you may love travel, you may love all these things. It's about, again, listening and finding space for agreement in the same word so that we can advance all of our interests and live in a safer and a better word. So good luck to you. Have fun in this negotiation. Um, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks, Corey. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Jones. We really appreciate you speaking to our students today. And you mentioned loving your country here in the U.S. or other nations. And I, I would like to mention that this is our first ever time having students attending from outside the United States at BYU MU. And we have several students attending from Mexico, and we're very excited to have them with us today. So um, thank you again. Students, I am your executive director. My name is Marie Colbeth, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our online Model UN today. I want to introduce a few people to you. Um, you are going to meet them in your committees, but my staff who's been working all year to prepare this consists of uh, your Secretary General who you've already met, Anna Briner. She's also the Director of Human Rights Council One. We also have Liam Dalton, he is your Director General and the Director of UNHCR. Jenna Cook is the Director of General Assembly Plenary. We also have Amanda Gatch, who is the Director of UNICEF. Brad Gassenti is the Director of Human Rights Council II. Anella Hansen is the Director of the World Health Organization, commonly known as WHO or I should say WHO, not WHO. I don't know, I'm, I'm tired, guys. Um, and then we also have with us our Chiefs of Staff, Jake Stebbing and Isabella Arrigo. We have our Chief Technology Officer, Sheldon, 
uh, Packard, who you can look to for help in Gatherly today if there are any issues. And then I also want to say a huge thank you to Corey Leonard, uh, who introduced the ambassador. Corey is the director of the Model UN program, uh, along with our other instructor, Bill Perry. Uh, we work together to teach Model UN to the BYU students who are now helping host Model UN for all of you. Um, I'm very excited to you know, welcome you to a brand new format this year. We understand that there will probably be some technical issues. If you have any throughout the day, you have the help number for our uh, Google Help Desk with Sheldon. You can also ask any of our staff. There is a Help Desk uh, portion of the screen in each floor, each committee on the Gatherly platform. So please visit um, that area if you do need some assistance. We also have uh, staff members from BYU who will be roving throughout the Gatherly platform. Um, you can see on the title of their little box that you know they're a staff member for your committee. We have people who are specifically assigned as mentors to help you out. We understand that this is um, an intimidating format, but we really wanted you to use it to meet people and to be able to really experience um, Model UN. I also wanna say in terms of people who will be roving, we have some additional diplomats who will be joining us today for closing ceremonies. Um, George Ward and Joey Levitt, but you may also meet them in a one-on-one -on -one interaction on the Gatherly platform today. So um, be aware, you might have a chance to meet somebody whose job is to do exactly what Ambassador Jones has been talking about, to find agreement in places where countries might um, typically not uh, necessarily recognize the ways they could work together until some diplomacy happens. So um, with that, I do also just want to, to briefly share with you if I can remember how to share my screen on this platform. I can't, so it's okay. Uh, don't worry about it. There, there are some parts of diplomacy that you are going to be experiencing today that I just wanted to address really quickly and then I'll send you back to the Gatherly platform. And uh, those are, you know, you've been working on research as preparation for this. You've got some uh, sheets that are telling you how to do parliamentary procedure if you've never done it before. Uh, we're going to focus today on the, the public speaking diplomacy side of um, the Model UN experience and also the writing side. You'll be working together in groups to create resolutions, to take resolutions some of you have already worked on and turn them into group work that reflects consensus. So as you're going through those, just think about the way that those activities influence what's happening in the world today and how you see it happening, you know, in real time. Just this week or this last week, uh, we've had news come out that there's potentially um, a viable, um, a, a viable uh, vaccine for the pandemic, for the COVID-19 which potentially could, you know, have a really big impact on the world stage. But as you think about things like that, you know, when a vaccine is created, who gets access to it first? Because there's not enough right away for everyone, right? How do countries make decisions like that? How do they work with each other? And how do they translate that into what's happening, you know, on the economic stage? There are a lot of things that happen through diplomacy um, and they're real world problems that you guys are going to be talking about. You're going to be talking about refugee issues. You're going to be talking about healthcare, education, freedom of religion and belief. You're going to be addressing privacy issues as everything we're doing these days happens online. These are really big issues. So we hope that you enjoy engaging in the issues, but also engaging with each other. The goal of Gatherly is to help you do that. So um, we're going to sign off. Um, from closing ceremonies in just a moment here when I hand it back over to Anna. Um, but I want you to just keep that in mind that we're here to build consensus and to learn to talk to each other and listen to each other like Ambassador Jones mentioned. So thank you all for being here and I'll turn it over to you, Anna. The 31st session of BYU Model United Nations is now in session. Please return back to the Gatherly platform. Thank you.